Hello everyone, my name is Doug Hills and this is the Manga Studio Guide. Today's episode is the third part of my series dedicated to using the perspective rulers and their perspective guides to plot out a scene from various angles. In the first two parts I explained how to create a room in one, two, and three point perspective. Now it's time to take all this prep work and apply it by adding objects and people into the scene. Just a quick disclaimer before I get started. This video is not going to explain how to draw in perspective in great detail, because if I did, we'd be here for hours. For this video, I'm assuming that you have at least a basic understanding on drawing in perspective. If you don't, you may want to check out books like David Chelsea's Perspective for Comic Book Artists, which is a personal favorite of mine, for insight on learning how to draw in perspective. So with that out of the way, let's get started. In my initial sketches for this exercise, I set up this room with some various bits of furniture, like a sofa, window, cedar chest, and so on. So when I created the sketch, I was more focused on the feel of the room instead of scale or accuracy. But now that I have my room properly plotted out, I can use these measurement grids to go back and now draw in the furniture with its proper accuracy, scale, and consistency. So to get things started, let's go back to the example where the room was drawn in one point perspective. I have my grid all drawn up and I have my basic sketch placed underneath it. The first thing I do at this stage is block out the elements in the room. That way, I'll know not only how large they are in relation to each other, but also where they are in the room. What I don't know, at least from memory, is exactly how large these elements should be. For example, the size of this sofa. So I do research. Looking up typical couch dimensions, I discovered this site, dimensionsinfo.com. Now this site not only gave me the dimensions of a typical sofa, which happens to be about 3 feet by 7 feet by 3.5 feet, but also other pieces of furniture such as chairs, ottomans, love seats, and so on. And not only that, but this site contains information on all kinds of items. So needless to say, I've bookmarked this site for future reference. Now, coming back to the room, I know that I've plotted out the room so that each square on the grid represents one square foot. So I block out the couch at three feet by about seven feet by about three and a half feet. For the wainscoting or wall trim, I could have also looked that up on the internet, but I happen to have wainscoting in my home, so I just measured it. And that happens to be about three feet high. So I mark off the wainscoting at the three foot line. For the trim, I found that it's generally between six and 12 inches, so I made the trim slightly less than one foot high. For the window, I went back to my house and measured out not only the size of the window, but also where it is in relationship to the wall. And for the cedar chest, same thing. We happen to have one in our house, so I measured and blocked it out in the scene. Blocking out the wall clock was a bit more difficult as it's not flush against the ceiling or the floor. So while I could block out the height and the width, I had no gauge to block out the depth. So what I did was I started from the ceiling and blocked out my depth that way. Then I just extended the lines down until they crossed near the position of the clock. From there I added my depth lines and now I know where the clock will go. So now I have my room blocked out and it's time to start refining it. Now once again the first thing I do before anything is research. While I know basically what a couch looks like, researching it gives me a wider variety of styles to choose from and ultimately create. So I find the couch style that I want and I use that to draw in a flat version along the wall. This is going to serve as my guide which I can then use to block out elements such as the arms and cushions and eventually create the couch's depth. And after a few more rounds of sketching and refining, I have my couch. I then go and apply this same method in various ways to the rest of the room. The wainscoting, the window, the cedar chest, the clock, and the rest of the room. And about 45 minutes or so later, my room is all drawn up. So it's cool that I have all my furniture done, but it's not exactly a comic book scene if I don't have people in it. And again, a problem that I've had when drawing a scene out is getting the people drawn in their proper scale relative to each other as well as the scene that they are in. And I found that I could use the wireframe to add in my figures just like I did with the furniture. To get an idea of the placement of a person, I may block out an area, much like I did when I blocked out the couch or the clock. And using a combination of the wall and floor, I could get an approximate idea of where I would want to place a person about 6 feet high in the scene. To get the proportions of the figure correct, I do something similar to what I did with the couch. I create a flat sketch of the person along the wall, and then I draw out perspective guides along key parts of the figure, the head, rib cage, knees, and so on. From there, I can use those guides to sketch out my figure. And sometimes I don't even bother with the bounding box, and I just build off the flat figure and the perspective guides. And then when I have my rough sketch done, I can go in and start adjusting and refining before eventually finishing these figures up. So that takes care of a scene of one point perspective, but what happens if I start adding in more vanishing points such as our two point perspective example here? Now despite the change in perspective, 
the process is exactly the same. I create my boxes to block out where the items are on the scene, and then I sketch and refine them until I'm done. And thanks to the work that I did in the one point example, I know exactly where to place the items in the scene. For example, I know that the couch is still three by seven by three and a half squares, but I also know that the couch starts about one square out from the far wall. So with that knowledge, I can now block out the couch at the same size and position I did in the one point example. And the same thing goes for all the other items in the scene, the wainscoting, the window, the trim, the rug, and so on. Then I rough out, refine, and eventually ink up my scene until it's completed. Now, if I turn on the perspective grid for the far wall, I'm going to use that as my guide to add in my figures, just like I did in the one point example. Now, I can either sketch in perspective lines using the straight line tool and add my figure in that way, or if I switch back to the perspective ruler and change content of process to add guides, I can use those additional guides to gauge the placement of my figure. And with those guides in place, I can rough in and eventually refine the figure. And even in three point perspective, the same rules apply. I block out my elements, I rough out and I refine my shapes, I ink everything up, and if I want to add figures, I use perspective lines as my visual cues to add them in their proper scale and position. So ultimately, it doesn't matter if I create my scene in one, two, or three point perspective. As long as I have a basic idea of the scene I'm trying to create, I can use the perspective rulers and their perspective grids to plot out the basic dimensions of my scene. And with this information, I can add whatever I want to the scene, and I know I can create them at the proper size and position, as well as with a level of accuracy that I could not achieve without the aid of 3D programs. And while a situation may still call for 3D programs such as SketchUp, Poser, or even the 3D models in Manga Studio to create a scene, it's definitely nice to have this method in the toolbox should the need arise. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this episode of the Manga Studio Guide, which is brought to you courtesy of Patreon subscribers like the ones you see here. Thanks everyone. If you'd like to support the Manga Studio Guide and help me keep these videos free for everyone forever, you can subscribe for as little as a penny per video on Patreon or by purchasing books, rulers, page templates, or just throw some money in the tip jar on my online store. Thank you so much for watching and for your support. I'll see you next time.